Thank you, Malcolm, for such a nice words and good evening, everyone. And, uh, you know, it's so nice to see friends, family, and colleagues here. Um, and really what I want to talk to you about today is about my own journey um, in this sort of this journey of, of HIV medicine from the past, present, and future. So I want to start with this just because before I talk about the present, before I talk about the future, it's good to reflect about the past. And I know that for many of you here today, when you think about HIV, you still think about these images, right? You still think about these images, images of the past. But HIV has changed dramatically during the last 20 years from a disease that was really little with a very poor quality of life to a manageable long-term condition with a life expectancy that is almost matching that of the general population in, in, in many cases. And really is because of the advances, not only advances in terms of diagnostics, um, but also because of the introduction of treatment combination of antiretrovirals that have become the gold standard for the management of this disease. 2000, this is a younger me. Um, I was just graduating from medical school, and one thing that you can tell is that obviously I look younger there, but the haircut is just the same as the one that I have now. It never changes. Uh, so really my first encounter with HIV was here in Bogota, which is my, my hometown. And this is the hospital Simon Bolivar, which at that time in the late 90s and early 2000s was the main referral center for people with HIV in the city. Now, most of the patients that were living with HIV were actually located in the seventh floor. Medical students were not allowed in that floor. Um, and in fact, the only reason why I knew about that particular floor was because when I was doing a general medicine rotation in the hospital, we heard about a young person that jumped part of the window that was living with HIV from that floor. And that has such an impression, really such an impression in me, because I thought, what? condition, what disease can actually lead you to do something as extreme as that. Now, Colombia is a beautiful country, um, but in the late 90s and early 2000s, it wasn't really the place that it is now. We had a lot of problems with armed conflict between left-wing guerrillas, the army, drug dealers, and a lot of people within the country were displaced internally, lots of people living in their villages difficulties with accessing healthcare. And if a person was living with HIV, you can imagine that actually accessing treatment, not only because of the conflict, but even the geography of the country was a difficult challenge. We have very few medications, and again, access to those medications was very, very limited. And while I was doing my residency in infectious diseases and general medicine in a military hospital, I also could see the impact that stigma associated with HIV was having in, in, in people. Because soldiers that were diagnosed with HIV, because they went you know, to different places in the country and got infected, were actually discharged without any support. So at that point, I was reflecting, well, maybe I need to do something. I need to kind of learn a little bit more about this condition. I need to really get trained. There wasn't really proper training for this in Colombia at that time. And that brings me to what happened in 2002. So in 2002, I decided, well, I just maybe need to go somewhere else. And, and I selected the UK because of the great weather. And <laughs> so leaving, <laughs> I mean, I was so wrong. But le <laughs> leaving family, friends, and a residency, I arrived to the UK. And 2002 was, uh, was a great year. I don't know if you remember. It was a nice sort of summer. I thought, well, this is true. It's such a great weather. I made the right decision. It was the Queen Golden Jubilee at that time. And I started working at St. George's Hospital, the clinical infection unit in Tutin. Great food around that area. You, you, you are around Tutin. Really, really nice. Um, there really I just realized that actually managing HIV was very, very different. And if, for those that are here, that obviously some of my colleagues, you remember, or what I remember when I was there is that actually, you know, things like Counseling for HIV testing was, was a thing. We still needed to do counseling for HIV testing. If someone needed an HIV test, they needed to kind of have a counselor to talk to them about the implications of having a test. As an SHO, 
we used to see a lot of opportunistic infections, things like cryptococcal meningitis, problems with the chest, and so on. At that time, patients on antiretroviral therapy only got access to treatment if they were immunosuppressed, so big changes. And also the options in terms of treatment were very, very limited. Many patients had to take lots of different tablets, and a lot of these tablets were quite toxic for those patients even then, in, in 2002. And there was a stigma, a stigma associated with, with the condition that prevented patients from engaging with care. Although never at the level that I experienced when I was, um, when I was a doctor in Colombia. But I think what St. George's really, really gave me was the opportunity to meet my wife. So for that, I thank St. George's a lot. That's what we met, very romantic in the sort of clinical infection unit um, <laughs> next to a sort of TV patient, fantastic. Um, Moving on, then I decided, okay, you know, there is an option here to do research, there is an option to train in this. And in 2008, I became an academic clinical fellow in HIV and sexual health. And I think I was one of the first cohort of academic clinical fellows in the country. That program just started around that time. And I went to work at uh, St. Mary's Hospital, uh, which is really, really a, a great place to, to work. And I think there have been, between 2008 and 2015, been significant, significant changes to the management of HIV. No counseling was needed now for HIV testing. Very important in terms of breaking those barriers so people could access testing if they wanted to. And also we realized that if we treat people effectively and they become undetectable, which means that actually we can control the virus in the blood, then there is an opportunity of actually eliminating HIV transmission. Pre-exposure prophylaxis started to kind of develop as an important preventive tool. And pre-exposure prophylaxis is essentially people at risk of uh, acquiring HIV infection, they take tablets to prevent getting HIV. Because of a big, big trial, multi-center trial, we now could start people on antiretrovirals despite of any type of, of immunity, whether they were immunosuppressed or whether they were just going, uh, kind of restore immune system. But stigma was still there. Stigma, is, stigma was still there. And we still have problems with patients that were facing a stigma. A stigma at different levels, not only internalized stigma, but also a stigma from other healthcare professionals, sadly. But in terms of medications, there was big, big advances. Not only new tablets, new compounds, compounds, but also the development of these single tablet regimens, which obviously, it really revolutionized in many ways the way that we manage HIV because it helps with adherence to therapy and also the medications were becoming less and less toxic. And all these advances really, between 20, 2008 and 2015 really, meant that actually life expectancy of people living with HIV, providing that people are diagnosed early and that they, we can manage their comorbidities is matching that of the general population. And this is a fantastic achievement in such a short period of time. I don't really think there is anything in medicine like this from an epidemic that um, still kills, but was killing really a lot of people. Amazing achievement. But even then, I started already to think, well, if people are surviving, then we're gonna have an issue with aging people living with HIV and all the challenges that aging brings. And also, I started kind of seeing a lot of patients with issues with memory and concentration in the clinic, complaining of these things, although they were effectively treated with antiretrovirals. HIV infections were still increasing. There were still infections, many, many infections every year, people with particularly late diagnosis of HIV. And sadly, stigma was still there. Stigma, still a problem, still an issue, still patients complaining of, of, of this. And I decided that that was gonna be my research interest. My research interest was gonna be in aging people with HIV, I'm gonna be working on brain health and so on, and decided to do a PhD. So sweat, tears, just to even get the funding to do the PhD, not even doing the PhD, playing to be a neuroscientist, when I'm not really a neuroscientist, but somehow I managed to kind of finish it, which is great. So completing my PhD, looking at neuroinflammation in people with HIV, and that was in 2015. And it was that year, 2015, that uh, I was appointed as a senior lecturer here in Brighton. So this is where the story in Brighton really begins. In 
2015, very sunny. You see, it's always sunny, bright, and always sunny. <laughs> and very quickly, I realized that actually I was kind of right. We had a lot of pe people that are aging with HIV. And this is just some recent data, just looking at the number of older people living with HIV in Brighton. And Brighton has one of the oldest cohorts of people living with HIV in the whole of Europe. So we have a lot of older patients, because patients, they want, some of them want to retire in Brighton, so they come here to retire. So we have a lot of this. Um, if you think compared to other places where maybe they have about 49 people, 49% uh, of the cohorts that are kind of reaching 50, we're already there. We've been there even in 2015. And that's a situation that is happening not only here in the global north, but it's also happening in the global south, particularly in low and middle income countries, uh, where really the greatest burden of HIV is. So if you start thinking about the healthcare systems of these places might not be geared up to actually deal with the consequences of you know, older population or living with HIV. So it's a big, it's a big issue globally. And really the question is, well, how HIV is affecting this? Because when we get older, we tend to get more chronic conditions. We tend to get more diseases. We all know that. I know that. I'm already kind of taking more medications than I thought I was going to take at this age. So the question is what HIV is actually doing to this. And what we know now is that people with HIV have more comorbidities compared to the general population. And these comorbidities are appearing a lot earlier than in the general population. And these are just some of the chronic diseases that people with HIV are affected. And, and this is very important to understand why this is happening. So we're talking about issues with cardiovascular disease, for example, issues with uh, cognition, memory difficulties and concentration, bone disease, issues with renal disease and so on, and even issues like menopause that also affect women living with HIV. And what we've been doing really during the last few years, the, you know, the research team is trying to characterize this a little bit better, trying to understand if these comorbidities affect people with HIV in a different way than the general population. Are these comorbidities, the treatment of these comorbidities and the outcomes are the same or different? And also what should we do in terms of screening? Should we start screening earlier, for example? So we've been kind of working really and this is a work that has been done across the whole of the UK, just trying to kind of answer these questions. And also working with some of the populations in the Global South, because that's very relevant for, that, for those populations too. And um, really brings me about what is, might be causing this phenomenon. And really, as many things in medicine, again, is all about mul multi-factors. And in the case of HIV, you start thinking about things like lifestyle. So a lot of our patients tend to drink more, take recreational drugs, and so on. We have the impact of medications, all medications that used to be very toxic, causing a lot of problems with uh, chronic diseases. And then there is the issue that HIV is an inflammatory condition, that despite the fact that people take treatment and they are effectively treated, there is still an inflammatory sort of um, balance that is, is not quite, quite as it should be. And then there are the individual factors associated with aging, because we all age differently, and that's something to do with genes and, and other phenomena. To give you an example of this is some of the work that we are working now on. is that relationship between depression, inflammation in people with HIV, and this is work that has been done by one of our uh, PhD students, Arish, who is here today, and trying to understand this relationship between inflammation, depression, and HIV is quite critical because depression and mental health illness is a big burden for our patients. The prevalence of depression, for example, is about three times higher than you will see in the general population. So understanding this relationship is key to developing new therapies and to be able to predict who are the people that are going to be developing these symptoms. But another thing that we realize here is that because people are aging, they are also developing geriatric syndromes. And geriatric syndromes that are presenting maybe about 10 years earlier than in the general population. And with that, I mean things like mobility decline and falls, functional impairment, difficulty just doing simple activities of daily living, like getting dressed, like shopping, and so on. Very difficult. That you can all pretty much put together in the concept of frailty. And that's something that, again, was very unique to Brighton. I, I, I remember, and even we have now a lot of fellows that come to the clinic, to the service, and, 
and I was with one of them, Harris, who is visiting from Greece, and he said to me, but this is the first patient. We had a whole list of patients, and he said, this is the first patient. We only have one patient that was under 40, under 50, in the whole sort of list. And a lot of patients have these problems. And what we've been trying to do is trying to kind of understand a little bit better what are the factors that are associated with things like frailty not only here in the UK, but also in places like Ethiopia, where obviously the social determinants of health are completely different. You know, a lot of the people in Ethiopia are farmers, for example, and they still kind of, you know, do the farming, although they are older. Very different from populations in the global north that what they like doing when they're older is traveling, for example. So very different determinants of health. So trying to understand that relationship is important, but also it's important to kind of do something for patients. And I think Brighton has been a pioneer in developing services, particularly incorporating ger geriatrics into HIV medicine. And this is a service called the Seedberg Clinic that was set up by Julia Wright and also Martin Fisher in 2012. And I think when I arrived in 2015, I took this over because of my interest in, in aging. And what we have been doing during the last few years really is trying to kind of provide evidence that services, services such as these are needed and are important to managing all these sort of complications that patients have. And a lot of this work has been done again by early career investigators like Natalie that has been really trying to understand with patients what exactly is that we need to do in terms of frailty screening, how we should talk to patients about this, how can we sell this, and also how can we just show the evidence that doing something like this actually really works and makes a difference. And as a result of that, we, you know, we've been working really, really hard. And we've been work, working very closely with a lot of different organizations within the city, like the Sussex Beacon. So we developed what I believe is still the only exercise program for people with HIV called the Positive Living Program at the, at the Sussex Beacon, where people with HIV can go and exercise without thinking about the stigma, for example, of going to a big gym and so on. But also working very closely with other organizations like Launch Positive, for example, that addresses issues like social isolation, which is absolutely key for our population, particularly here in Brighton. But always interested in the brain. And I think one thing that people really worry about is about their sort of cognitive health and memory. And, and that's, that is true. And if you think about people with HIV, that is the case too. And this is just a very interesting document done by one of the biggest charities in the UK that work with people with HIV, when you can tell that about eight out of 10 people living with HIV are concerned about memory. And it is a concern for them because they need to take the tablets. Why do they forget to take the tablets for HIV? And uh, also, how are they going to manage all these other chronic conditions? And a lot of our patients in the UK are really men that have sex with men that live on their own. And they don't have you know, family to kind of help them. So they have to deal with a lot of these a lot of these issues. So it's a, it's a big, big issue. And we think about cognition and the impact of therapy. Back in the past, we used to see a lot of HIV-associated dementia, mainly because there was no treatment and the brain was invaded by the virus. But with therapy, luckily, we don't see a lot of HIV-associated dementia. However, we do see a proportion, a significant proportion of patients with difficulties, with concentration, with memory, and so on. And that has important clinical implications because people, they do stress if they don't remember to take their tablets. It is implications in terms of employment, for example, in terms of independence, in terms of thinking what is going to happen to me if I don't remember things, if I cannot function. So it is very critical. And looking at the UK, we think that about 10 to 15% of people with HIV has some type of cognitive impairment, either memory or concentration problems. And we're trying to kind of think about what are the possible causes. And really is thinking about multifactorial things. And one of the pieces of work that we've done is looking at, at the neurobiology of this. For example, inflammation. And this is just some work that we've done where we show for the first time that people with HIV, without any neurological symptoms or memory difficulties, compared to HIV negative individuals, have inflammation in the brain and that that inflammation might have actually some repercussions in terms of their cognitive function. But also we are very much interested in what is the impact of the treatments that we give in the central nervous system. 
And I think what we, the work that we've done really is about informing clinicians and people that work with, uh, with patients about which is the right treatment for the right patient. So we have been working very hard to provide this evidence to kind of determine if antiretroviral therapy has an impact on the brains of people with HIV. But again, it comes down to the patient. You can explore, do fancy imaging, you can do fancy biomarkers, you can do you know, lots of different tests, but ultimately what is there for patients. So in 2016, we set up what it is really the only dedicated memory clinic for people with HIV in the UK, and it's called the Orange Clinic. And what we do this, what we do there really is about dealing with uncertainty. We spend a lot of time telling people they don't have Alzheimer's dementia, basically, as many memory clinics do. But at least we offer a possibility of patients to get assessed. And I think what we have shown recently, as you can see in this graph, is that the interventions that we're doing in the clinic are actually having an impact because patients are remaining stable in terms of their function, or even they are improving. And that really is something important because it means that something, that at least we're trying to do something for patients as they were just complaining all the time and nothing really was happening because there are no really therapies, uh, at least tablets for, for this problem. But again, it's not only about interventions, it's about also about thinking in terms of the quality of life. And this is some work that Kate has done, one of our postdocs, looking at the impact of quality, the impact of cognitive impairment in the quality of life of people with HIV. And really it's about developing interventions. And a lot of it is about information. It's about getting people to understand why they have some problems and what they can do about it. And I think she's been very good at kind of putting a whole program of work looking at providing that information for patients, carers, and healthcare professionals, looking at HIV and brain health, just simple messages that patients don't know. And this is, this is really, really amazing work. It's not fancy, you know, biological therapies or tablets or anything like that. It's just simple things, but it's something that can make a difference to patients. So, so far I have talked about the management of, the advances in the management of HIV disease. And it's time to talk also about the amazing advancements in terms of prevention strategies for preventing people from acquiring HIV. And this has been really key for us to think that it is possible to eliminate HIV transmission. It is possible to eliminate HIV transmission. If we do all these things that are all evidence-based, very important. And as a result of that, because of all these sort of prevention strategies, the United Nations HIV and AIDS program, UniAIDS, set these very ambitious targets that started in 2014 and were reviewed in 2022. And the targets are that if more than 95% of people are aware of the HIV diagnosis, of which more than 95% of people are treated for HIV effectively with antiretrovirals that we know work, and of which 95% of them are vir virally suppressed, I mean they are undetectable, then we have a chance of actually eliminating HIV transmission. What a great thing if we can achieve those targets. So what has been our response here in Brighton? In 2016, Brighton became the, the first fast-track city in the UK. Now, what is fast-track cities? It's really an international um, sort of initiative supported by organizations like UniAIDS to support those cities that can demonstrate that they have a commitment to eliminating HIV and ending this discrimination against HIV patients. And I think we, in Brighton have shown that commitment. And I gotta to explain to you how we've done that. So in 2015, the Martin Fisher Foundation was set up on memory of Professor Martin Fisher's um, outstanding contributions to, you know, in the field of HIV. And I've been honored to be a trustee of the Martin Fisher Foundation since the very beginning, since 2015 when I started here. Working together with the city council we develop a whole strategy to be able to eliminate HIV by 2030. But we wanted to go more than that. It's about towards zero HIV, really, and also ending discrimination. And the strategy is about developing innovations in testing and care. It's about challenging stigma 
always challenging stigma and making sure that everything that we do is evidence-based so we can actually share our expertise with other fast track cities and other cities so they can learn from our experiences and they can apply those interventions. But always, always involving the community because it's always important to develop things that actually the community want, know what healthcare professionals want. It's always very important to involve the community. And that has been really the pillars of our strategy. So we're gonna show you now some examples of what we've, we have done and some of the results of that, because it's, it's quite interesting. So for some of you, you probably remember about, maybe this is our most famous sort of project, which is the vending machine project. And this is about developing vending machines that dispense HIV test and STI test. They look very fancy. We have about 10 machines in the city, including the universities, both Sussex and Brighton. So if you feel like you need one test, you probably can go now to the student center and get one if you need to. But what it does is it improves access to STI testing, particularly for people that don't attend traditional healthcare services because they, you know, they don't want to, uh, because of the stigma associated with STIs. For this work, we, you know, we, we are award winners. <laughs> so we won a, a BMJ Award of Innovation in 2018. It has also been sort of recommended in WH guidelines for good practices in, in Europe. And again, we keep providing the evidence that actually this intervention makes, makes a difference. And as I was mentioning, the principles of sharing this with other places, as far as, you know, really, really tropical places like Bristol, for example, where they have four machines and one of them is in, in the mall and they're doing really, really well. So this is sharing the expertise. This is you know, really from discussing with patients to developing something, to implementing it, to making a difference. But it's not only vending machines. We've done other pieces of work. During COVID, projects including you know, testing rock sleepers in, in hotels, then amazing project of opt-out testing in A&E, where anyone in A&E that goes to A&E can have an opt-out test for HIV. And more recently, a GP project that involves mainly getting phlebotomists to request an HIV test instead of GPs. So in a sense, you're breaking more of these barriers that we have in terms of testing, which is absolutely important if we want to reach those targets. So this is, what, this is the results, guys, and this is amazing, right? You remember those 95, 95, 95? And this is work that has been done not only by the fast track cities, but also by the sexual health service and the Lawson unit, of course. And you think about these numbers. I mean, this is great. We are the best in the, in, in the UK, really, in terms of these numbers. There is still a little bit of work to do for the 95%, because we're still 5% that we need to ensure that they get access to testing. And also there is a lot of work that goes into ensuring that people remain suppressed, they remain on treatment. So there is still a lot of work, but this is an amazing achievement. And that's what we have achieved during the last few years, which is amazing. And that really is the situation in the UK. So this is good news. You think about eliminating HIV infection, this is how it looks like. Less infections every year. What an amazing achievement. This is great. But the stigma is a big problem. And remember, I've been talking about the stigma from the first slide, stigma is still a big problem. Stigma kills because people don't access treatment. They don't go to healthcare professionals because they feel stigmatized. That's a situation that happens here in the UK to a lesser extent. In other countries, you cannot even disclose that you are HIV because you could be prosecuted and you, know, and you could be put in jail. That is the situation that we're facing. So it's important to, to work on this. And that's what the foundation has been doing. Some of you probably have, remember some of these campaigns with the stigma sore. Almost certain, if you live in Brighton, you have seen the bus that really gives a simple message that HIV isn't scary anymore. It's a long-term condition. We can treat it. We should not stigmatize it. And I have to give really a special mention here to my colleague, uh, Jill Dean, because she's been such a driving force on all these sort of interventions, really just talking to the community, doing all that, and really in charge of doing the research bits. But it is amazing what we can do if we kind of work together. And these are just some examples of, of, of the work that we've done. So what is in the horizon then? What is the future? 
Can we see? Can we see that? Yes. I think for the first time, we think that there might be the possibility of a functional cure for HIV. And there is a lot of resource going into this. Of course it is. And these are just two examples of people, of a couple of patients that actually were cured of HIV by having a stem cell transplantation. Now, before you get excited, we're not going to be doing that because it's quite, a, quite a, a, a severe way of doing it. It's because of all the reasons that they had this. But it's a proof of principle. And there is a lot of very clever researchers looking for this. So I think within our lifetime, we might see something like this, which is an amazing thing to think about. We also have long-acting antiretrovirals, which means that we can deliver antiretroviral therapies in a different way. Patients can have an injectable ART every couple of months instead of taking a tablet every day. So you think about the implications in terms of treatment, adherence, people that feel stigmatized just by taking a pill because it reminds them of being HIV all the time. There are implants that might be coming as well, and obviously intravaginal rings, which in terms of prevention of HIV, can be a, a great thing, particularly for vulnerable populations in the global south, thinking about commercial sex workers and so on. So really important advances here. And this is, this is here, guys. We are doing injectables now in our clinic, which is great. And we are becoming leaders in research in this area with projects not only here in the UK, but also in, in, in Africa. And, you know, we are very close of eliminating HIV transmission. And this government is, whatever you want to think about this government, probably I think the same, but if there is one thing that they have done, is actually supported this idea that we can eliminate HIV transmission and actually give some resources to make that happen. So well done for them, we have to say. And so there is an opportunity here for us to kind of grasp this and being able to eliminate, eliminate HIV transmission in the UK at least. But I'm a cyclist, I like cycling a lot, and I always see things in a cycling way. There are lots of challenges still ahead of us. You know, we've gone a long way, but there is still challenges. What are those challenges? First of all, there is less money. There is less money, and we need more money to be able to finish the job. You can just see the projections here by 2020, 2025. And because of COVID, there is less money. And because of all the things that are happening, there is less money available. And you can imagine how vulnerable, particularly low and middle income countries are because a lot of the rollout of antiretroviral therapy depends on money, mainly money coming from the US. And if you know, the person that I don't want to name gets into power, there is a risk that there is no money for this. So what's gonna happen then? Who is gonna pay for those antiretrovirals? It's a big challenge. I know, I have to mention this because it is a real challenge. We're talking about climate change. We're talking about war. If you don't have water, if you don't have food, the least thing that you're gonna be thinking about is about taking tablets, okay? You're gonna move your family, you're gonna take everything and go somewhere else. This is a big challenge. War can be very disruptive. And just thinking about my own country in Colombia where we got, people don't know this, but it's about three million almost Venezuelans that actually were, you know, move across Venezuela to Colombia, the second country after Turkey. And we already seen the impact of this in terms of HIV, um, of HIV outcomes. Rates of opportunistic infections, things that we didn't see because Colombia has a, a healthcare system very similar to, to here. And we're gonna see more of this because of war, we're gonna see more of this because of climate change and so on. So although we are very close of eliminating HIV, we need to think about these challenges. Very important. But also the issues about you know, equality and equity. And this is something that we all know COVID highlighted very well. That is not only about physical health, it's also about social determinants of health. It's about where people live, it's about whether they have food, whether they have heating. These things determine how they're gonna be doing in terms of health outcomes. That is very important. But also we need to think as researchers about equality in terms of research. And this is on what the Irish has done, which is, is fantastic. And here, you're just looking at the number of studies that are involved, cohort studies of aging. And you can see that the majority of those studies are studies of why men that have sex with men in the global north. That's not where the burden of HIV really is. We need to kind of think about the other, you know, the other group of people as well. 
We need to still doing the research, providing that evidence because it is needed. We need to think about equality, equity, and, and, and make sure that we, you know, we provide that evidence. And that's what we're doing. So this is a lot of the work that we've been doing during the last few years. A lot of the work is done in, you know, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, but we've gone as far as Japan, and there is no a lot of data coming from Japan, and there are a lot of problems there, I can tell you. Um, but also, you know, locally, I've been able to kind of work in Colombia as well, and trying to kind of give something back in terms of training and start thinking about those challenges with, um, with refugees from Venezuela and, and issues about the stigma as well. So there is a lot of work that we are doing to try to provide that data, which is very, very important. And the only way that we can do this is by having a very good team. And when I started here, because of all the difficult circumstances, I was the only clinical academic, but now we have a really exciting group of early career researchers that are really ready to kind of tackle all these challenges. And this is very important to have, you know, enthusiastic investigators um, that want to really work in this area. But it's not only that, obviously, we're lucky to have a fantastic team here in Brighton, and I, I can tell you that this is the best clinic, the best HIV clinic in the country. There is no doubts about that, and I have worked in other clinics. It's not because I work in Brighton, trust me. It is one of the best. So it's, I mean, patients here really, really, they are very lucky to have such a good team. And also we have our sort of Center for Global Health Research, which offers that support, leadership, example really about how to develop those partnerships with the Global South. So it's all, we talk about equity and making sure that, you know, the power dynamics are the right ones. And that's very critical in this, in this area. So just to finish really, because that's, that's going to be almost my last slide now. Don't be a pessimist and think that we're not going to be able to do this because of these challenges. Not only be an optimist, thinking that everything is going to happen with that action, okay? Be an activist. Be an activist. You can make the difference. You can educate yourselves. You can educate others. It's the only way that if we work together, we can actually really stop the virus, we can improve the quality of life, and we can end discrimination. So let's work together on all this, because we can do it. I'm sure that we can. And with that, I'm just going to have to say thank you to lots of people that's what I'm doing in different languages. But really, it's about thanking you know, family, friends, colleagues that have helped me through all this journey, my own journey, um, through HIV, HIV medicine. And I think the journey continues, which is always very exciting. And with that, I'm just going to say thank you very much for listening. Um,